Raw real. We about to get it started. Reality based. Show the sunshine, no scripts, no lies, just pure entertainment. So here's a question for you, Peter. Uh, sure. Considering you're also a journalist as well as a content creator, let's go through your journalistic roots and how you first got into content creation. Take it away, my good man. Yeah, yeah. For, uh, I guess a quick intro on me, uh, mm -hmm. Peter Pischke, uh, independent journalist. I've been. In, I went to J school. That is a terrible uh, decision, by the way. Pretty much waste your money. There's no money in journalism, even before this. The last two years where. Uh, Google has been throttling every news site on the net. Even before then, there just wasn't any money in it. So putting putting an investment into an education to then go work in journalism, where if mm -hmm. even if you're doing like really great, you're maybe making sixty or seventy k a year or US. It's so not a wise decision, but it was good for me. I enjoyed it. I've been working off and on for about ten years. Uh, my specialty is. Uh, my training and then what I was reporting on is disability and health journalism. That's where – that's my focus. That's where my expertise is at. But I've written for national outlets. I've done some entertainment reporting on the side. Um, I really – I I nothing really against that. Um, I work mostly as freelance. Uh, that, that whole background, you know, how that all jumped into culture scape is interesting because mm -hmm. – I really enjoyed uh, working as a writer and a journalist and trying to bring news information. But I really definitely in the last few years, I got very tired of the, you know, the negative feedback loop that mm -hmm. seems to exist online. You know, I would do uh, stories or popular stories, places on like conservative outlets. And, you know, it, I would notice even here on YouTube, there's this constant outrage mechanism because the only way really to get people to respond you needed those emotional responses to get people to come read your stuff so uh news outlets right now really rely on the outrage cycle so you have to get people energized and usually that means angry mm -hmm. and i just got very tired of it because it, it feels like we've been going through this negative cycle so long that people forgot why they even like some of the stuff to begin with and i i've been a nerd i've been a geek my entire life since i was a itty bitty baby I love all this stuff, video games, comic books, manga, anime, computer games, tabletops, uh, TCG, whole nine yards. But it felt like to me, and you could see it sometimes in the reaction space on YouTube, mm -hmm. you know, it feels like we've all forgotten like why we like this stuff in the first place. We're always only reacting negatively. We're always kind of angry and outraged and pushing back. And so I was like, <sighs> you know, I'm, I'm tired of this. I don't. I don't want to be someone that's pushing out all this negative energy all the time because I don't know if it's actually helping. So I was like, let's let's back this up a little bit and let's try to talk at, at it from a more positive angle. So I had a few friends and I, I'm comfortable doing interviews. Not everyone is. So I was like, you know what? Let's see. Let's see if we can put a, a, together a little show, reach out to some people and talk about how these things came together, where they're from. Because I mm -hmm. think I think nerd culture for example is fascinating and i think in the in the hullabaloo we kind of forget that this stuff any individual element of it, it it's it's amazing like D, D is having its 50th year you know this is this incredible thing that came out from deep in minnesota just a bunch of guys hanging out uh they were sick of playing um military tabletop games which you you know kind of you use like rulers you like mm -hmm. get long you have a big room and then you have rulers and it's 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 not very interesting in my opinion but anyhow and it, all of that it just kind of started this little group and then over time it built and built and built it got more people involved eventually there was a company then you had a pr mass product and it just grew and grew and grew well none of that it all started from minnesota but, but there's this whole story it, it isn't like just dungeons and dragons you know poof it's a national success, you know, it, it didn't just come out of nowhere. And I think the outrage, we forget, like, these things that we have are, are amazing. They're wonderful. Mm -hmm. They're special. And so I was like, let's do a show where we talk to the people that built these things. That's why for the tagline for my show, Culture Scape, is the show that interviews the, the geeks and the geek creators and influencers that built mm -hmm. nerd culture. And that's what we've been uh, doing on the show, and I'm very, uh, very happy to say that so far it's uh, been successful, or at least successful enough that uh, I've been able to continue doing it, and oh, uh, yeah. it's been awesome. I mean, you've done very well, and and you've managed to put very well 
that highlighting the problem only goes so far. You know, I have the three steps to victory, highlight the problem, find the solution, be the change you want to see. And a lot of folks, for understandable reasons, are either stuck on step one or step two. But it just goes to show it takes all sorts to be a content creator. That's why I boil down everything I say into, into cliches. That way I don't ramble on and on and then have a blooper and then not know what I'm talking about. Because, you know, I really feel sorry for Joe Biden, folks. He's like in his late 70s, early 80s. He doesn't know what he's saying. And I kind of feel like that in my mid-20s. Yeah. It's, it's not even the camera. It's the brightness. Everything's just too bright, but I don't look bright. But it's good to see uh, Immortal. I hope you're doing well, my good man. Talk about a creator who who is being the change that he wants to see. That third step, very important. Although I will say, ladies and gentlemen, when I uh, looked into this fine fellow creator, because I call everyone a content creator, doesn't matter if you're a, a mainstream journalist, an independent journalist, or an ordinary average Joe having a good rant and rave. As I said before, it takes all sorts to be a content creator. But uh, before we get into your first video on the culture scape, I will say that you've tangoed with the best of them, Peter. And I said this to you before the, uh, I think before the show started. Mm -hmm. See, my memory is utterly awful. In regards to the uh, opioid crisis, because you did mention earlier that your specialty is in, in healthcare and, and disability when it comes to journalism. And I've got a list of a few names here who, who you've interacted with, only a, a small example because you've interacted with a lot more likes of Michaela Peterson, Dennis Prager. I was very surprised to find out that you interacted with Rucka Rucka Ali. My good there, there's a person whose music I always and and songs, parodies that I've always uh, enjoyed. That's why I say folks, this guy has been around for many, many years, even pre-culture scape. And that's why I think he's a, a very great talent, criminally underrated considering the people he has had good talks with. doesn't matter their political orientation. And that's why I thought it would be, you know, an honor and, pardon the pun, a privilege, you know, white privilege, to, to have P Peter on the show. So is it still a, a big crisis, Peter, in your part of the world, the opioids? Oh, that's that's a heavy topic. That, that the experience with Ruka Ruka Ali, that was that was interesting. It was he has I think he still does. He has this mm. this YouTube and podcast he does with like mm. him and then it's like the actor that played the devil on Supernatural and like another guy. <laughs> and I guess they're like libertarian and caps. Yes. And that was fun. That was mm. that was fun. That was a fast I I don't think I've ever done a, I've been on a show quite like that before. Um, well, yeah, go, no, it does. It does, though, go to show, Peter, you've interacted with progressive minded individuals. You've interacted with libertarian minded individuals and you have interacted with conservative minded individuals. So from my perspective, you're the perfect bridge builder. And I think what you've done with the culture scape is a great example of that. But you were saying, no, no, I that that it, I know I'm a bit of a. <sighs> When I, you know, this is kind of, this is kind of my, my whole, my whole deal is like, mm -hmm. I remember, you know, when politics hadn't invaded everything. Okay. <laughs> so I'm thinking, I'm thinking back, you know, uh, you know, Star Wars, Doctor Who, but even like, like uh, news to some degree, it's, mm. it's much less political than, than it used to be. I, mean, I don't want to say that people necessarily were more normal, but the interactions definitely were. And that's the kind of world I just feel like I kind of want to bring us back to, because it used to be no one cared who you talked to, right? You could mm. go, you could talk to someone who's left leaning, you could go talk to someone who was right leaning. It's like politics was part of our lives, but it wasn't so big that like I go to the anime convention. Oh, you can't talk to him. That guy's a Trump supporter. Don't 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 go talk to him. Oh, that guy, that that gal over there. I think she, I think she voted for Clinton. You can't, you can't go talk to her. Mm. Uh, don't do that. Well, have I you, was like, have you ever not? considered ASMR with that voice, Peter? My oh my, That'd please. Be, that would be please. interesting. No, I I I don't think I have the patience for it. I just feel like it's. I think these games we play are mm -hmm. are very silly. But I know that's. Mm -hmm. the, I'm the weird one. I know I'm weird in that, like, because everyone is freaking out all the time about 
whatever even if it's like these the the comics community which mm -hmm. honestly isn't that big they're constantly even like the independent right-wing side of the comics community they're mm -hmm. always arguing amongst themselves about who did what who did who said who talked to whom mm -hmm. and i'm just like i just don't care about any of us <laughs> i just don't care i so well, I'm, I'm gonna go talk to a lefty if i'm gonna go mm -hmm. talk to taylor renz i'm gonna do oh. it <laughs> i don't care what you guys think if I'm well as someone, someone on the right Awesome. As someone who is 24 years old, I don't remember a world that you described, Peter. Because, you know, that normal world that was normal when you could interact with folks no, no matter their persuasion. You know, back in the day when Tucker Carlson worked for CNN, that sort of era. I was like six or seven when that was a thing. Yes, I am 24. No one believes me. I'll be 25 in like a week, literally. <laughs> it's like yeah, it is a week. So, yeah, next Saturday I will be 25. So the world you're describing, Peter, for better or for worse, I I never saw it. And, and a new generation it hasn't seen that. It's this polarized environment that's that's the forefront. Hmm. No, that's, that's a good point. And that is a little, uh, your age is fine, but I was going to say, it is a little worrying because I feel like, you know, if we, we, we if the, if we've gotten stuck mm. on whatever switch got flicked and we're just stuck on on and we're never going to be able to turn it off again. I hope that's I hope not. But sometimes I do feel that that seems to be the uh, the timber of uh, where mm. everyone's at. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that's off track from what you were asking about the opioid no, it's crisis. Fine. It's fine. Uh, the opioid crisis is is difficult. That is a very tough issue. That's very contentious. Mm -hmm. Um, I got involved in that because I was already a health reporter, but I'm also a disabled pain patient. I have, uh, I have a bunch of fun illnesses that contribute yeah. to my disability, but I, one of them is chronic pancreatitis and there aren't a lot of good treatments for it. And there are many, many illnesses. I would say even most illnesses that there isn't actually a treatment where it's going to make you better. It's, we can only treat the symptoms and then we try mm. to make you comfortable and be able to live a fuller life. So that that's the situation with chronic pancreatitis. That's the situation with many illnesses. And so part of the treatment is pain medicine. So that's opioids. And what's happened with the opioid crisis is because of the backlash trying to deal with this heart issue, you can see it in the United States, you can see it in the UK, Canada, and Australia, especially, they've decided, well, you know, government being the, are, are just very smart politicians and regulators to say, well, if it's called an opioid crisis, right? <laughs> That means we're going to stop the prescription <laughs> opioids when statistically that is that was not nor has it now been the problem. But unfortunately, you know, that's that's who's kind of been uh, felt the brunt of this backlash. And so that's kind of that's kind of what pulled me in personally and professionally into it and it's still kind of a uh, unanswered, unfixed problem. We, I mean, I was going to say we've been, we've seen straight increases of overdose deaths over the last five years, but this last year we actually had a small dip, which was really nice to oh. see. But we're still at uh, just in the U.S. Just not 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 even talking mm -hmm. about other countries. Just the U.S. We are over one hundred thousand people dying every year of an uh, opioid overdose, which is just Ooh. terrifying. I, could you imagine, folks, a foreign nation? Ending the lives of so many Americans a year, that would cause a massive backlash. But since it's, you know, an internal issue, it's nowhere near as covered. I mean, if the circumstances were even slightly different, if it was from the outside in instead of the, you know, inside out, then it would cause a, a massive backlash and efforts would be made uh, to, to bring it to an end. I mean, the, the coronavirus crisis is proof of that when hundreds of thousands, if not millions, uh, perished. As a result, efforts were, were taken to, to bring down that crisis. But that's, a, that's another show. My goodness. If ever we did current affairs or history, my, oh, my. That, that's a great advantage of reality-based, Peter. Nah, Peter, can't speak mm -hmm. today. Uh, is that you can literally turn anything into a show. Healthcare, current affairs. We actually did a few episodes of politics. But uh, in this case, this show is all about you and the impact that you have made. And it is a considerable one. In regards to your first video on record, that was from, in, <clears throat> let me pronounce it correctly, old content. 
is literally called that, uh, interview with Blake Harris, History of the Future. Wow, History of the Future. You know, sometimes I don't think when I when I write these things down, you know, it's more of a process thing, but what a title. And that was on April the 15th, 2019. Of course, it probably wasn't the first thing you ever did, but on record, oh, it's Five it's years there. ago now, wow. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, uh, I've I've picked away at YouTube now and then. This the the culture scape is not my first attempt at doing some YouTube. It's oh. just my my first actual successful. Attempt. Oh my! Well, it's called the second run. It's called my second run for a reason, folks. I mean, the first run was a disaster. Second run, thankfully, gained traction. Reality based came to be, and we are where we are today. So. That kind of is how it has to be, though. Like, mm. like the fab, the popular image of how YouTube works is, well, just one day you decide to make a video, and that's this just it's just this huge hit, it's just everywhere, and you're just amazing. You're as good as PewDiePie. You just you could do it all, and that's that's not it at all. You ha you have to learn all of this, and you you learn it very slowly, and you learn it one little thing at mm. a time. I mean, that's true of anything, honestly. But oh, absolutely. Uh, Definitely mm. content creation. Yeah, but I, I had done a few. I have done interviews for a long time, just the format. I like the format. Uh, it dep I mean, it really depends on what the interview is and who you are interviewing. If it's something mm. tense, so if it's a controversial topic or it's very hot breaking news, the person's involved. Obviously, it's not as fun because mm. <laughs> I think I had. Oh, uh, I'm trying to I think, think we, of their names. We, they're on, yeah, they're we, on Joe we, Rogan. Well, uh, I will say, Peter, in regards to your most popular video, that was a very controversial for the time. We'll get into that in regards to creator highlights. But one thing's for sure, folks, in regards to, to starting, it ain't easy for a viewer to become a creator to start and then to keep on going and then to keep on growing. It can be very, very difficult. And of course, I'd make you a mod, Black Angus. Because you've been on the show. That's usually what we do. We'll do it for, for Peter when I have the time, either during the show or after the show. And uh, I'm actually due to do it to, to Frog Tony as well because he's been on. I've been so busy, folks. It's, it's hard juggling those bloody grenades, isn't it? Yes, go and check out. Go and check out Peter. I'm sure you'll enjoy what he has to offer. I, I saw him, you know, typing some things up. Were you, what were you searching, Peter? I was just looking. I, so sometimes when you do interviews, so this is mm -hmm. not culture scape, but okay. it, if it, so there are interviews you do where you're with a very willing participant and it's very relaxed and it's, so that's, I, that's more the type of show that I like to do on culture scape mm -hmm. if I can, because I feel like people are more willing to give information and you have the time to space it out. You can really break into these stories, mm -hmm. but sometimes if you're in a, like you're working for news, you know, you may not have very much time. You may have five, 10, 20 minutes. And the t person you are talking to, they may not be uh, the most um, willing to speak with you or in the happiest mood. I know one time I was had to interview for a site. I had to interview Eric Weinstein, uh, him and his oh. brother. I, they're, ac they're very popular academics, big YouTubers. Mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to remember. Oh, what was it? Before, before there were Twitter voices, there was that platform for like a year or two. That the, you would go on, you would sp be audio based. You know, you know what I'm talking about. This is before Twitter Spaces, the pre-Twitter Spaces, Clubhouse. So he was, oh. he had some kind of thing going on with Clubhouse, and then I had to talk to this guy, and the interview was not friendly, and it was, it was uh. just. And that's how often it, it, how often it is when you're in more of a newsy format, because you're like, mm. well, you know, why are you talking to me? Is, is this, you know, is this the angle, of the story that you want me to be? I think a lot of the time when people. There are definitely times where journalists are not being fair, but I think often a lot of the time that comes from the feeling that, you know, if you're the one being interviewed, the journalists are, are just going to take advantage of you or they aren't being fair. It's often because these are situations where the point of contention isn't necessarily what you want to be, and maybe it doesn't put you in the most flattering light. And so sometimes that's a situation that you find yourself in. Mm. Uh, that was one of those. Other times, though, like more like on culture scape you're with someone that wants to be there or or at least you know you're in a friendly position and you get you're gelling and it's a much more uh maybe the casual is a nice word but it's a much more positive you know hmm. vibe going oh, on it's the future from my perspective it, it's the future of media and to a lesser extent entertainment and that's why that's why 
especially in, in the establishment, the word journalist, from our perspective to them, to use that binary term, uh, <laughs> journalist is a slur. <laughs> it's yeah. not a word that that inspires positivity and, and confidence. It, in my view, it's a it's a damn slur, and especially in this day and age, that's why you know you worked hard to become a certified journalist, and by the time you could put that into practice the profession sort of collapsed yeah. in on itself. That is correct. That term. is a very accurate reading. Yes. Hmm. Uh, that is not my fault though. That that's, that's other people. <laughs> they, they are the ones that decided to cause trouble. That was not, I don't me. blame you though, Peter. I mean, one of the reasons why I dropped law studying it for six years from 16 to 19 was because I saw the writing on the wall with the age of, of digital technology. What's the point working so hard in to get into an industry that's going to, for lack of a better term, fuck you off when all this damn processing and, and uh, machine learning comes in to do all the middleman work? So that's why I'm like, yep. Yeah, Got to got to hit the curve and and do something else. Mm. And here I yeah. am. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. I don't know. It's mm. it's hard to gauge. The future is very hazy right now mm. because mm. technology is so heavily involved. I think I think with what's going on with news, I think I've known many people who are who are journalists, especially ones who are much more successful than I am, that everyone's now pivoting to video because they feel like, well, Google is making it. And because the state of the news industry will can you make it in news still? Is there a career in news? If not, well, look at YouTube. YouTube's a healthy program, so they're pivoting to video. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are doing this right oh, now. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think this is going to be one of those meaty talks, folks. So who knows? Might be two and a half or even three hours. You never know. You never never know i apologize i know i've it's got fine. i haven't really engaged with the because you, you, you were asking about the the no, first video so well it's fine i mean it's it's literally called old content so from that perspective you know it's not really linked to culture scape if you know what yeah, i mean yeah yeah mm. yeah yeah no it's it's fine it, look it's interviews are cool and i enjoy doing them um mm -hmm. they can be they take a lot of work and a lot of investment and sometimes you mm -hmm. do it and you you're like sometimes you can do it and you're like yeah people are going to engage with this people i'm sure you're having that thought about having me <laughs> show like people <laughs> people are like i'm gonna get clicks i'm gonna i'm gonna get some script i'm gonna get people to click subscribe people will talk about on twitter and they're like mm -hmm. i i don't know if anyone's gonna watch this you get oh we, we always we always have that mindset because if i can do it so can all the fine folks and fellow creators. And, you know, most people here, born in the 20th century, brought up in late 20th, early 21st century, zero-sum game, that sort of thing, us or them. If everyone can do it, then no one can do it, that sort of mindset. But because I am so young, although I don't look it, I'm of the mindset, especially with digital technology, we have the means now to really live in a reality-based world. It's it's in the it's in the name instead of a financially based world. And usually most people will now look at me like I am a communist with 100 heads. No, you can still have private property. Yeah.